Okay, Parshas Baalais. I don't have a book. I don't have it open over here. Baalais. It's a long Parsha. It's a lot of stuff happening in this Parsha. It's like if last week we were like we had like a little bit, you know, we had three things, and then we had the Nesiyim repeating. That's not this Parsha. That's this week is like every ten verses. There's another thing happening. There's another story happening. So some of the things we're going to touch on. More somewhere to touch, unless we're definitely going to touch on everything a little bit. So we're starting from chapter eight. Well, it actually starts at the beginning of a parak, chapter eight, Hasa Aleph, verse one. And the first thing that we're going to hear about is what you guys started yesterday in the Mimer with Rabbi Shapiro about creating the, the of creating the menorah. Not sorry, not creating the menorah. We're having that when Aaron lights the menorah, when Aaron lights the candles, we're starting the whole, we're having, we're starting the, the conversation of lighting the menorah. Now it's interesting. This is not the first or second or third time that the menorah is being mentioned. I think this is maybe the fourth time that we're having conversation, whether we're talking about making the menorah, lighting the menorah, making the oil for the menorah. Now we have, so, so Rashi says, why do we have the menorah right next to last week's, the first, the Parsha of the Nisim where they brought their gifts because Aaron felt terrible. He thought it was because of his involvement in the Eagle that he and his tribe were not part of the dedication of the, of the, uh, of the, of the Mishkan. And so that's why he felt terrible about the whole situation. And Hashem says, don't worry, I got your back. You have something awesome about it. There's something, there's something, you have something special that's going to go and it's going to last, you know, the sages talk about how it also connects to the Hanukkah candles. We're not going to get into that. I don't, don't want to go into this in great depth because you're going to be talking about it in the next classes with Rabbi Shapiro, different aspects of it. I want to talk about two things. First of all, we have a lot of laws that we have coming up over here with the Menorah that, um, that, Aaron, as a kind of he wore a, what's that? Not a headband, it's a, a diadem. I thought that was a Harry Potter word. I think it was a real word. A thing, that thing that said Kodesh Tashem and said that he was holy Tashem. He was not allowed to lift his hands above it. Okay, so he had to light the menorah, which is tall. He can't light it like this, even if he could reach it. So there were steps in front of the Nair because the Nair was tall. I think it was six or seven feet high. Um, so there were steps because he couldn't raise his hands over. When, the, when he blessed the people, he also didn't put his hands over his head. He put his hands under. So he couldn't go under that, 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 that plate that says that he's holy Hashem. As one of the other thing that's very, very important that I'm um, to the Okay. The, uh, the other thing is the idea that when Aaron lit the Menorah, Kabbalah and Chassidus talk about this a lot, that the menorah has how many branches? Seven, right? It has the middle and the other six, and it refers to all the soul sources of neshamas, and, and what Aaron's job was, was to illuminate souls. His job was to illuminate every single kind of soul that was ever going to be, and the way he was supposed to do it, and Rashi says, Ad shall heves where is the Rashi? The Rosh over here till the till it's able to light on its own. We all know because when we like candles, you sometimes oh, we said I should have good. So we did this already. So once so there's something that I want to talk about this. So we have this, but we're gonna skip this. Then the other thing I want to talk about is that Rashi says about that Aaron did this in Pasuk Gimel says Vayas Ken Aaron that Aaron did this Lahagid Shivchay Shal Aaron Shalashina to say the praise of Aaron that he didn't change it. Like, if God told me to do something, I would probably listen. Like, what's the haggage shift? Like, what's so praiseworthy of Aaron that he did, that he did what he was told to do, right? Um, so different chassidish as far, and one of the things that they mentioned, it's kind of like as a drush, as like a, 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 like a, a lesson on the side, is that here's Aaron. What do we know about Aaron from Pirkei What do we know about Aaron? What is, he, what is his, his thing? What is his motto? Avos Yisrael, right? He loved right? And Pirkei says, be like the, the disciples of Aaron, love peace, pursue peace, love people, and bring them closer to Torah, right? It's in the, the first chapter of Pirkei All of a sudden, Aaron becomes the Kayin Gadol. He's not just Moshe's brother, Aaron, which is a pretty awesome thing, like the two of them as like the leaders, taking people out. They're pretty impressive people, but now he becomes the Kayin Gadol. He becomes Kaidish Hashem. He becomes holy to Hashem. And the Hasidic Hashem say, Veloishina. He didn't change his behavior. Not that he didn't change in what Hashem Hashem, Hashem says, do this, and he did something else, but that he himself didn't change it. As he grew in stature, as he's now the Kayin Gadol, there's nobody 
higher than him. He's the only one who's going to now be going into the Holy of Holies once a year. Like he could so be full of himself and he could be like, you know, this isn't befitting a person of my stature, but the Chlish Farm say, he doesn't change his behavior. And I want to give a shout out to us as we grow in our relationship with Hashem. There's a place below Shina. We don't get to use that as a place of superiority or I don't know, all those kind of all of those kind of words. There's there's something very in, very important in Valeshina. There's yes, of course we're changing and of course we're growing and of course we're developing, but there has to be this place where we really there's something that we we stay we stay identifiable to ourselves and to the people around us. It shouldn't be like, oh, she has no sense of humor anymore. Oh, she's like such a, she thinks so highly of herself. She thinks so lowly of us. None of that is, and we really learned that from Aaron, this place of it doesn't matter what you're going to end up doing, but you, uh, but you're, but you should, you should stay, uh, you should stay the same. Okay. One more thing, which is very interesting. Another, one of the other Chassidish's farm talk about the idea is, um, that that in the beginning when Aaron feels bad that his he and his tribe don't have any kind of part in the thing so Rashi says he's quoting from the Gemara that Hashem says Chayecha I like I kind of swear like I swear that that yours is going to be greater than theirs and it goes on to describe that he's going to have the Meir and it's going to continue on you know for many much longer than just the Nesim and one of the Chiddushes farm say that Chayecha because of your life, because of your behavior, because you didn't just take the status quo and say, whatever, if we didn't get it, you know, God knows best. And we're just going to like, we clearly weren't meant to have this, but it bothered him that he wasn't part of the dedication. And therefore, Hashem, because it bothered you, you didn't just say, it would have been nice, but you know, whatever. He, he, it bothered him. So because of the fact that it bothered him, it's something that Hashem says, I'm going to give you a reward for that. And we're going to see this echoed a little bit later on in the Parsha um, when we're going to come to the, when we're going to come to Pesach Sheni. So we're going to continue. We're going to skip over to discuss the Menorah a little bit. The next thing we have, starting from like uh, uh, chapter eight, five, six, seven over there, we have the dedication of the Levim. The Levites are now going to be inducted yeah, that's a good word, inducted into the service of the Mishkan. And it talks about the sacrifices that they need to do and what, how they have to, how they have, what they have to do and how they have to be. Aaron has to lift them up. One of the, the, one, the Medrash says that he did it all in one day, that the dedication of the Levium was all in one day. So if there's 22,000 Levium and Aaron has to lift each and every one of them up like a, a carbon, that's, a, he has to be really strong, and B, he has to work really quickly. So that's that's one measure. I'm, I don't know if that's like actually how it happened, but there's definitely that measure going on over there. Huh? 22,000 Levium that had to be inducted into the service. Um, the other thing that happens to the Levium this one time only is that every single bit of hair on their body is shaved off in preparation of them becoming Levium. Now, on... Uh, on a, on a Kabbalistic level, it has to do with the fact that Levim come from Gevura and here is a place of Gevura. I don't know enough about Kabbalah to speak about, to speak about intelligently. I'm just telling you that this is like from a Kabbalah point of view, like in order for them to be in this place, they have to sort of remove the extra level of Gevura for them to be able to be receiving and to be able to be giving. On a practical level, this is going to be the seeds of, one of the seeds of the rebellion for Korach. In a few parshas, we're going to read about Korach and his rebellion. And one of the one of his complaints are that the, all the Levim and Korach is a Levi. We were all shaved like you know, like chickens. We were plucked like chickens. And Aaron has this beautiful beard, and he looks beautiful and luxurious. You know, like now the hair grows back. My father always says that the worst haircut looks good in two weeks. But but even. So that place, I don't know if they pulled out their eyelashes. Yeah. That, that, that does not sound like that would, I don't know. I don't know about the eyelashes. That sounds yeah. right. But, but every other hair, lots of other hairs on their body. So that was all coming up. So Kaira, 
the men, the Levites who are going to be working in the, in, are going to be working in the base of, in the Mishkan. And then later, well, it's not going to happen to them ever again. So it's just what people are going to be working in the Mishkan. It's not going to be happening to the people who it's not like, Oh, everybody who becomes a late, you know, at, becomes of age has to be shaven. It's just this one shot deal. Um, and, and Korah's not happy about this and it's going to come up later once, you know, like once you have this and then you add another thing and then you add another thing, then you end up with a Korah rebellion, which is going to happen in two weeks time. But, but here are going to be the seeds of this. And then we have, um, so this is, so this is pretty much takes us to, uh, the end of the, of the second Aliyah. Okay. The end of the second Aliyah tells us that the, the Levites work from uh, from 30, from, from 30 to 50, for, sorry, come in at 25. They do five. We spoke about this. They come in at 25. They have five years of, of, uh, imp- apprenticeship or residency or whatever you want to call it. And then they work from 30 to 50. And then after that, they don't do the heavy work anymore. Okay. Sababa. So far we've covered what three, three different things in two alias. Okay. Chapter nine, we have, uh, we have the conversation. It's the first year after the Jews left Egypt. And Hashem tells him to do the, to bring a carbon Pesach. Okay. And on the 14th day, and it gives him the, the laws of how you bring a carbon Pesach. Great. This is what we're going to do for the for carbon Pesach. And then what happens? Who's going to read for me from six and seven and eight? Jamie, go read. There were men that had been contaminated by a huge force. They could not make the Pesach offering on that day. So they approached, approached Moshe and Aaron on that day. Those men said to him, we are contaminated through a human corpse. Why should we be diminished by not offering a shen's offering at the appointed time among the children of Israel? Keep going, keep going. Moshe said to them, stand and I will hear what the shen will come to you. And I want, to, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, Moshe is the only prophet ever who has God on speed dial. Okay. He has a question. The people come to him and they say, you know, they, they, br- they bring their, their claim to Moshe. And hi- what is his response? Wait here, I'll check it out. That's not how prophecy really works for anybody ever, ever, ever. It's only that Moshe has this ability to go for prophecy and to reach for prophecy whenever he wants it. Other prophets have to get themselves into a prophetic state and to be happy and all these kind of things that they're in the times of the temple, there was actually schools for prophecy. You could learn how to be a prophet. And if all the conditions were met, then you could, in fact, perhaps get a prophecy. But Moshe was the only prophet ever who was able to just say to people, and it happens more than once in the Torah, where Moshe says to people, wait here, I'll come back with an answer in a second or in five minutes, whatever. He doesn't say, he says, he says stay here and wait, I'm going to get an answer. That means there's an immediate, there's going to be an, an immediate um, conversation going on, which again, is going to be relevant for the end of the Parsha, when we're going to have people talking about Moshe. But here we have, so Moshe goes, he, he finds out what they're, what they're saying is, what does Hashem say to them? Emma? Uh, 10 and 11, 10 and 11. To the children of Israel, saying, Any man will become contaminated with human corpse on a distant road, whether you or your generations, he shall make the face off offering to our shem. In the second month, on the fourteenth day in the afternoon, shall they make it, but not to some bitter earth, shall they eat it. They shall not leave over it from it until morning, nor shall they break a bone of it. Like all the decrees of the face off offering, they shall, shall they make it. Okay, so we have, so we're now we're giving the laws of. A second Pesach, Pesach Sheni, where there's a chance that somebody was either impure or far away, um, then they can they have a chance to bring it. And they basically, when you bring the carbon Pesach, when you bring the Pesach Sheni, you have like you have to eat it like the carbon Pesach, meaning it has to be cooked the same way. You have to eat it with bitter herbs and with matzah, but you don't have the same obligation of having all the all the chametz out of your house, just like. They don't have to like again do Pesach cleaning a month later, which is, I guess, a good thing. Um, so there, there's kind of be it's going to be like a, a blend of how it actually works practically speaking, and um, and then but that says if somebody was in fact pure just couldn't be bothered to come, then they don't have a chance to they don't have a chance to come and make it up. There's a whole conversation in halacha about what happens to somebody who becomes bar bas mitzvah between the first Pesach and the second Pesach, or somebody who converts between the first Pesach and the second Pesach. So they weren't obligated the first time because 
they they didn't have the status of needing to bring it, would they now be like, would they bring it the second the second phase? Like it's a it's a long conversation. When Mashiach comes, we're gonna figure out what the answer is because until then it's not gonna be a relevant conversation. But there's a there's a whole conversation about like is it are they considered separate mitzvahs? Are they considered the same mitzvah? Like if I wasn't obligated then, am I obligated now? What's so powerful about Pesach Sheni? Right? What's so, so, so powerful is, and it's, again, it's going to be similar to what happened with Aaron. Here were people who didn't accept the status quo. This was a law. If you're, if you're impure, you can't bring the carbon Pesach. You're, it's no fault of your own. You don't get punished for it. You can't bring the carbon Pesach, right? And that's the law. And they, and, and they could have, nobody would have blinked if they would have said, man, this is terrible. Why, why were they impure? They're carrying the bones of Yosef. They're carrying the, bro- the bones of the brothers, the tribes. They're carrying them to Eric's stroll. They're doing, whole, they're even doing holy stuff. They happen to be impure and they can't go, they can't then bring the carbon Pesach. But they don't do that. They don't say, man, lost opportunity. That that would have been really sweet if we could have brought the carbon pesach. They don't say that. They go to motion. They complain. And they say, "Why should we lose out?" Lamanigar, why should we not have this chance because we're impure? Now, in this particular case, they happen to be impure because they're doing something holy. But the but the law is going to come down for anybody. It doesn't matter why you are going to be impure at the time of the first pesach. It could be for something beautiful. It could be you just had a baby. It could be anything. And it, and it could be not. It could, it could be for, you know, it could be for the opposite of something good. But, but because they were bothered by, this, by, this, uh, by this, this lack, they didn't have the obligation to bring it. They were telling me they didn't have an obligation. And they still said, we don't want to lose out. We want to have the opportunity to have another way to come closer to God. We want to have a way to connect on a deeper level. And because it bothered them, because it bothered them, uh, so Hashem gives us, gives us this, this mitzvah of the second Pesach. Now, what's interesting is in the beginning of, of this chapter where it starts talking about, over here, where it talks about uh, Pesach Sheni, where it starts talking about the, the things, the beginning of chapter nine, so Rashi says that this whole story about Pesach should have been said at the beginning of the Chumash. It's, in, it's out of order. So what? So Rashi is very easy to say, eh, Torah is not in order. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But, but the question still asks, and, and, and Hasidus says, like, what? He says it, it talks about, it's, it's, a, it's a genusa. It talks about, it, oh, so Rashi says, why? It's we have at the beginning. Mipneshu genusa she Yisrael. It's a, it's a disgrace for the Jewish people that all 40 years that they were in the desert, they only brought this carbon Pesach. They only ever brought this carbon Pesach. So the Rebbe asked him, Sikha, like, why is this shameful for the Jewish people? Pesach, the carbon Pesach, is actually tagged to when you will come into the land of Israel, you'll bring the carbon Pesach. This Pesach, the fact that they brought a carbon Pesach ever in the desert, is an anomaly. It's the exception to the rule. Really, Pesach is connected to the Holy Land. So, so why is this shameful that they only brought one carbon Pesach? And, and he says, tag it to the people who had Pesach Shani. Pesach Shani came from people who had no legal obligation to bring the carbon. They could have just said, gotta wait till we get to the land of Israel and Marasa. But that's not what they did. They came and they said, we're bothered by this lack and therefore we want something else to happen. And, and, and basically Hashem saying, why didn't it bother you that for 38 years in the desert, you never brought a carbon Pesach? Why did, you didn't have to. You didn't have to, you had no obligation. It's tied to going to the land of Israel. And at this point, the people are still going to the land of Israel. But Hashem says, why, 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 why did you learn from those people? Why did you see people who had no obligation and who were so bothered that they came and said, is there any way, can, can, can you like, we're in Israel. Can you do some kind of kombina for me? Can you like figure, figure something out? Can you like hook me up with a way to bring the carbon? They were bothered. They wanted it to happen. Hashem's like, why did you just let it slide so easily? Why were you, meaning later, once they get the decree that they're not going to the land of Israel, didn't it bother you that you couldn't bring a carbon Pesach? Like, you're right. Legally, you had no obligation to do it. But where was that deep place inside of you that said, what? We're not going to do this. There's got to be a way. Somebody's got to figure something out. And the fact that it didn't bother them, they were able to sit back on the legality of it. 
Meaning, you hear what I'm saying? We can't fault them. We can't fault them. And yet, it's kind of like, where was your passion? Where was your fire? Where was your desire to do this mitzvah so that you went and begged for change? You didn't. We can't. We can't. So I, I, I want to give us a, I want to give us a bracha that we keep our fire burning, that we keep like wanting and 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 going for it, and not not taking the status quo and saying this is what it is. You know, it's 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 even it's Torah dick. You know what I'm. Torah says I can't, I can't, you know, but can we, can we fight for, can we fight for doing more? So that's, 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 I think one of the things that we have from, from, from Pesach Sheni, besides the fact that Hasid has talked about a lot about the idea that we never say, oh, I totally blew it. I missed it. I have no way to make it up. That's for sure. The first lesson of Pesach Sheni, but the other deeper lesson I think of Pesach Sheni is that a lack should bother us, even, even if we don't have a need for it, like according to the law, nobody's going to force you and say, you need to want this, but could we want? And I think that's something that we should, we should try to, you know, to try to tap in from, uh, should try to tap in from them. Um, okay. Today's Aliyah Ravi is, uh, we Did have, you know, the, what? Like women doing mitzvahs, the men, like traditionally do, that they should, that, because they feel like they need to do something too far or something like that. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think that, you know, it's, it's interesting. My husband and I both have great grandmothers who wore tzitzis. It's very weird. Of like of all, of all, of all the things in the world, we both have like great grandmothers and that was something that they did. Um, but they didn't do it instead of what they are supposed to be doing. They did it in addition to whatever else that they were, you know, like whatever their regular obligations are. And if, if our need for some, first of all, there's certain things that were just, there are very few things that we're not supposed to be doing, but more, you know, when we talk about, oh, women have so few mitzvahs and, you know, we're exempt from all those mitzvahs. There are very few mitzvahs we're actually exempt from. You know, we really are obligated in many, many, many mitzvahs. And the question is, before I say, those three that I'm currently exempt from, I want to do those three. Yeah. Did you, did, is your basket full with the stuff that that's already on your plate? And if it is, and you still need, then I would say, go to an LOR, speak to your, you know, your local orthodox rabbi and say, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing. And I still feel a lack. That's a different conversation than saying like, they have it. So I want it. You know, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same conversation, but, but I think that the place of, Fighting our norm for growth is definitely the conversation. You know, just because I may or may not have grown up in a community that encourages women to do whatever, you know, doesn't mean that if I have a great need for it. I'm not only talking. I'm, I'm here. I'm not only talking about mitzvahs. Actually, to be I'm, well, we don't. We women don't have a mitzvah say of Talmud Torah. We don't have the mitzvah to every single second be spent learning Torah. But just because we maybe are in a community that doesn't encourage women to learn deeply for their whole lives, does it mean that we should just say, oh, I'm, I'm just not going to learn? Or do we say, eh, you know, um, I'm not in yeshiva anymore, so like uh, I don't have to do this anymore. Like where can we fight for the things that feed our brain and feed our soul in a very deep way, even if it's hard to find it? You know, even if it's, even if it's not so easily available where you are. So yeah, definitely, you know, that definitely. But specifically, I think when you talk about mitzvahs, Fill our basket first, and then, and then if you're still lacking, I'm telling you, my my husband and I both have great grand. I'm like, why? why? And two from random different communities, totally, and they had the same. They had this. They ended up with the same uh, the same thing. Um, so that's what's going on over here. Okay, then we talk about. I want to remind us for a second. We're looking at this with history, and we know that the Jews aren't going any place very quickly. Right. We know they're going to be stuck in the desert for the next 38 years. They're not going any place. But that's not the current story. The current story is we're going to the Holy Land. So now we're talking, we're, we just have to keep remembering this. So now we're talking about going to the Holy Land. So what happens? We're all camped around Sinai. We're starting to leave Sinai. And what happens? How do we leave? How do we travel? And so now we're going to have a whole conversation about how do we travel? How do we know that it's time to travel? So the, so the Torah is going to basically give us three things that happen for the Jews to know that it's time to travel. Number one is that the cloud that was always over 
it, it was actually over the tribe. Do you remember we spoke about the camp? Yehuda was in the front, mm -hmm. right? So there's a cloud that was always over Yehuda and kind of over the, over the Mishkan. So when that lifted up, that was the first sign that everybody knew that it's time to start moving. And then when, uh, and then Moshe had, we're going to get to it soon in the next Aliyah, would have, uh, Moshe would say, Hashem, get, get up Hashem, rise up Hashem. And do you ever see when they take out the Torah? Okay, right. That's going to happen. So that's going to happen uh, in chapter, in like chapter 10, a little bit, a little bit later on. So Moshe would tell, say, Hashem, you know, rise up, Hashem, we're going to start moving. And then at the end of this aliyah, we have this commandment that Moshe, that Moshe is given a commandment to make chatzot's road. He's made uh, to make these silver trumpets out of similar, like almost everything else in the Mishkan, it was made of one piece of silver that was beaten and stretched, meaning it's not a mold and it's not, uh, it's not pieces that are, um, oh man, I'm losing my English. They're not pieces that are, that are um, welded. I was like, not melded, that's not the right word. They're, they're not pieces that are welded together, but they have to make these long silver, two silver trumpet things you know, and then it tells them what they would use it for. So they would blow two of them when it was time for the people to travel. They would blow one of them with a certain pattern when they wanted, when Moshe wanted to speak to the heads of tribes, they would drop, blow one of them with a different pattern when it was time to gather people for learning or for going for war. There was all different kinds of things. And, you know, so interesting because I like music, but I'm not really very musical. And I always was thinking like, how could you, like, what's the difference between one trumpet blowing and two trumpets blowing? Like, you, Who's going to know the difference? And I heard it, uh, there was once, um, I forgot his name, was, there was a very famous conductor who was listening to another orchestra being conducted. And after they asked him, how was it? And he's like, it was great, except one of the violins was missing. How many violins play in an orchestra? Like a ton, <laughs> like 25, 30, 50, I don't know. He was able to pick out that a violin was missing. Now, I would not, but I guess like, one or two, you would be able to hear the difference in the sound of what we're supposed to be doing. So basically the Jews have three signs when it's time to move. As soon as the cloud lifts up, everybody needs to like start moving quickly. You know, I, I think about it, we talk about, the Torah talks about the idea that um, the, the Torah could only be given to the people who ate the man. There's a certain, there's a certain principle or, or a certain quality for those kind of people. And I always think about this, this traveling in the desert, because we know that the Jews are going to end up traveling for the next bunch of years. For the next 38 years, they're going to be wandering around. They're going to end up some places where they're there for a very short amount of time. They're going to be in some places for a very long time. I think the longest place they stayed in one place, so I think 17 years, right? But you live in a place for 17 years and you still can't plant flowers. Not just because you're in the desert, because you never know when you're going to be get when you're going to get called to pick up and go. You know when you go to when you go on vacation and you're staying someplace like if you're only there overnight, you're going to actually unpack your whole suitcase. Yeah. You're going to you're going to if you're there for a week, then like already you're going to like settle in differently, right? The Jews never knew how long they were till after the fact. They never knew, so they I, there was this place of always being kind of unsettled in their in their space because literally the cloud could lift and within an hour we're going to be traveling that means you can't have like everything spread out all over the place and everything you know like so even if you end up being in a place for a very long time there's this kind of not permanent place and the the ability that when Hashem says yala they just got up and went and then you're like well I'm in the middle of the show I'm in the middle of this thing I just started doing it like there was none of that it was like we're going we're moving like it's time to go and we have to like do it quickly and with simcha and everything. And then they would have the trumpets would blow and then uh, Yehuda would leave, Reuven would leave, the, the Mishkan would leave, and then Ephraim would go and then Don would be at the end. And that's kind of how they traveled. I want to say something that's so, 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 so important. It took over 8,000 Levim to dismantle the Mishkan. It was massive, meaning it was the temporary structure but it was the boards weighed 150 pounds. They were 12 feet high. The sockets were heavy. The curtains were massive. Every single time the cloud came down and they had to rest, they put the Mishkan together. The first thing the Levites did was put the Mishkan together. 
It didn't matter how long they were going to be there, but the house of God was the first thing that they took care of to make sure that it got set up. It didn't matter if they were there for a night. It doesn't matter if they were there for a week or a month or years. But the first thing before they knew how long it wasn't like, it was like, okay, guys, this stuff we're here for like, you know, we're here for a couple of days, settle in. No, no, wherever they got, as soon as the cloud stopped and they knew this was the place, they immediately started to put together the Mishkan. And, and one of the lessons that really, that we need to, to take with us, the Mishkan is God's traveling house. And we have been traveling for, for millennia, for thousands of years already. We really, we've been traveling. We in our personal lives have been traveling for so long, for as, as long as we're alive, we've been traveling, we were going places, we've been doing things. And the place of having the Mishkan set up, as soon as you have a minute, as soon as you have a rest space, is the lesson to us that says, wherever we are, we have something to do here to make a home for God. We don't necessarily have to put up the Mishkan because we don't have all those pieces and we don't have 8,000 people traveling with us all the time. But wherever we are, we need to say, why does God want me here right now? The story I heard from, uh, from a woman, her name is Miriam Swordlove. Um, the, 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 the Chabad women have conventions. Like, so during the winter, they always go to different communities and they have the convention there. And in the spring, they always have it in Crown Heights. And one year they were someplace in the Midwest and ever the convention is over and they're all in the airport and there is a massive snowstorm and nobody, no planes are leaving. They're stuck in the airport now for a couple of hours and they, they were freaking out. I like, can imagine the days before cell phones, you can't like just sit in, everybody needs quarters for the pay phone and whatever. Anyway, so they get a bunch of pay phones, they call 7-7, they, they tell the Rebbe, they send a the message to the Rebbe that we are stuck here. We have nothing to do. Ah, like, I don't know if he's going to clear the snowstorm, but like, what are we supposed to do? And they got a message back that you are never stuck any place. If you are there for X amount of hours, there is something for you to do there. And she, she says that in, they had like a, they had like four or five hours till their flight was going to actually take off. And they started looking for Jewish women. What did, what a Chabad women do in the airport if you're stuck? They started looking for Jewish women. And there, she said there are women who started lighting candles for Shabbos because of their encounter in the airport then. And they kept doing it for years and years and years. Now, was there a snowstorm in the middle, in the mid, not in the Middle East, in the Midwest? And they got stuck just for these women to light Shabbos candles? Maybe. But the fact that they were there and they couldn't go any place for a bunch of hours meant there was something there that Hashem wanted them there for something to do here. We're not stuck here. Now, the, the challenge for us is when we're stuck in a place for a bunch of hours and we have Wi-Fi and we have a charger, we forget that we actually have a mission. We're not just there to catch up on, you know, yay, good Wi-Fi. What does God want for me here? We have stories of the Baal Shem Tov about them traveling just to make a bracha under a tree. Wherever we are, wherever we rest down and we are put down in a place, it's that we're there because we have part of the, the Mishkan with us and we have to make a home for God here, wherever we are. Um, and it's, and it's, a, it's a challenge, you know, it's easier to not. It's easier to just say like, I don't have to worry about anybody else over here. I'm like, I'm this little anonymous person and nobody really cares and nobody really knows. But the truth of the matter is, is when you're a Jewish woman, you're never a little anonymous person. And there's always something that Hashem wants for us. So we have the Chatzot, we have the Chatzot. So we definitely have something very interesting. Um, okay, first of all, they the, the, for, the thing we're going to have over here in chapter 10, verse 11, is once they have a command how to move, they actually leave Sinai. They've been at Sinai for a year minus 10 days, and now they are finally leaving Sinai. They've been there for a very long time, and it's time to keep moving. And it talks about how they, how they did that. Um, it actually, the, the Medrash actually says that they left Sinai like children running out of school, that they were like running away. They were running away. And, and Rashi says, it, it, well, yeah, because because um, they were like, no more mitzvahs. The longer we stay here, every time we stay here, we get more mitzvahs, we get more mitzvahs, we get more mitzvahs. And, and, they, and, and there was a place that, that Moshe was very hurt by that. Like that wasn't the right attitude of like, yay, let's get out of Sinai, let's keep moving. But, but there's also, I think, like on the positive side, 
perhaps one can say, and I didn't see this in, in any form, so this is just my my trying to to find a, a positive side to it, is like we learned and learned and learned and learned, and now let's let's put into practice. Like we don't need more theory; we need to have a chance to put into practice, which I think. You know, we're talking about how this, this we're almost finished here and like we're really at that space also like we've been learning and learning and learning and like how do we take all of what we learned and now start putting into practice so like i said i haven't seen that in any safer but i feel like someplace that has to also be true like they're that this them wanting to uh they want it they, they want to they, they need to start doing their work um and then what happens So, so, okay, so as they're leaving, so Moshe says to his father-in-law, come with us, come with us to the Holy Land. We're going to the Holy Land. And he says, no, I have stuff to do. He tries, tries, tries. And then he ends up, he ends up leaving. Um, so they go. Now, if you take a look in chapter 10, verse between 34 and 30, right before verse 35, you're going to find an interesting thing. What do you see before verse 35 and after verse... 36. You're going to only see it in the Hebrew. What? Before 35. Before 35 and after 36. What do you see there? You have to look in the Hebrew. Yeah, there's an upside down nun. Okay, Be, if you look in the Hebrew and see if you see it. Before verse 35 and after verse 36, there's an upside down nun. Okay? And and and, and the and the Chacham tell us that these upside down nuns are kind of brackets that these two verses themselves compose an entire book of the Torah. So according to one tradition, there are not five books of the Torah, there are seven. There's Bereshis, Shemos, Vayikra, Bamidbar, up until this point, these two verses, the end of the end of Bamidbar and Devarim. So you'd actually have seven books, not five books of the Torah. Um, and, and the question is kind of what's going on over here. So here we have the two verses are when the ark lifts up, Moshe would say, Come Hashem, let your enemies scatter in front of you. And your keep creature translating for me, Jamie. Um, 33. 35. Um, when the ark returned, yeah. Moshe, Moshe yeah. said, Rise Hashem and let your foes be scattered. Those who hate you, oh. for you. Okay. So, and then what, and then what happened? And what's the next verse? And when they, they would rest, Moshe would say, sit, you know, rest Hashem, you know, da da da. So, some of this Chacham say these are the opening and closing verses of a book that was never written. Because what was supposed to happen? We're supposed to go to the land of Israel. We're supposed to have the ark lead us in. Our enemies will scatter and then we will settle. And then Moshe will say, and now we stop. But that never happened. Because if you look into the next verse, what happens? The complaining starts. And, and that opportunity of that opportunity of we can just walk into the land of Israel and it is ours for the taking, that time is lost. That opportunity is lost. Um, there are other, you know, other conversations going on about what those two verses mean, but for right now, we're going to leave it at that because or else we're never going to finish the Parsha. The first thing that we have is that the people start complaining. We don't hear what they're complaining about, right? Chapter 11, it just says that they were complaining and it was, Hashem didn't like that. And, uh, and, um, and they, there's a fire that breaks out and, and kills people and the people cry out to Moshe and Moshe, you know, cries out to Hashem and Hashem listens and they call this place Tav Eira because the fire burnt, the fire from Hashem burnt there. Okay. So we don't know what they're complaining about, but one thing that some tell us we do know is that complaining is contagious. We don't know what their complaint is about, but we know that from here all the way to the end of the Chumash, we're going to be here. We're going to be hearing a lot of complaining in one form or another. Now, even if their complaints are 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 valid and they're holy complaints because they want more Torah, they want whatever's going on, whatever the different comment comment here is talking about it. This undefined complaining now leads the way for people to uh, to what are they saying now? They're saying in verse four, Rav Kashira, What are they saying now? We had this thing. People complain. Got a fire. There, we have a we have a, a plague. And then what happens? 
this craving, and then the Israelites went and said, if only we had meat to eat. Right? What do we, we remember? Keep reading. We remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, the milk, the meats, the onions, and the garlic. Right? And we are tired of this manna. We only have this man. It's we're sick and tired of this man. And the Torah describes the man as Kazer got as coriander seed. It was beautiful. It looked like crystal. And it was and, and it talks about how the people dealt with the mana and how the man came down and came down with layers and the whole situation. So I'm saying free in Egypt? You got free watermelon and cucumber and meat in Egypt? They didn't give you straw. What do you mean they gave you free in Egypt? And what does Rashi say? Free from the mitzvahs. We had no obligations. We could do whatever we wanted in Egypt. We weren't a nation with responsibilities and obligations, Hashem. And at that point, when Moshe hears this complaint from the people, he's not fed up. He's broken. He's really, you know, in verse 10, Moshe hears the people crying with their families and, and he's so upset. He's so upset. We've just spent a year at Sinai. We haven't learned anything. We haven't grown any place. Hash, Moshe says to Hashem, which is an unusual form. We should Hashem say Moshe. Moshe says to Hashem, why do you hate me so much? Why did you put me in charge of these people? Who, am I their mother? Did I give birth to them that I need to carry them, you know, carry them like a, like a mother, like they carry their children? Where do I have meat to give these people? You know, it's, and, and, and you know, in the conversation, not that he's saying I have to give them meat, but he's like, it's a complaint. It's not legitimate. It's not a real thing. When somebody's just complaining, you could give them and give them and give them fill the complaints, but it's not the issue. The meat isn't the issue. It's that the complaint is the issue. And Moshe's like, why do you hate me so much? Like, why do you make me do this? Why do you want me to do this? And what does Hashem say? Hashem says, you're right. You don't have to carry them all by yourself. There's, what does Hashem say? Hashem says, take 70, 70 elders, give them from your spirit so that they can also help lead the people and, and, and they'll be your help. Now, there's two things I want to discuss here. First of all, you know, like you hear Moshe, he's, he's here. He's not like here, he's here. And he's trying to pull the people up and he's trying to elevate them. And they had revelation and they had all this thing. And at the end of the day, he didn't get it. They don't, they don't get him. They don't hear, they, they, they can't get past the need to, to be here, so that physical, there are interactions with the physical are still such, have such a hold on us. And they, we don't hear Moshe saying, go for more, strive for more, be higher, be bigger, be better. They don't hear it and they don't, re they don't relate to it. And Hashem says, I'm going to give them people who they can relate to, who aren't as uh, lofty. I was saying angelic, but it's not really, you know, it's not the exact word. He takes, he said, we're going to take, we're going to get 70 elders. And Rashi says, where do we get these elders? Who are these people that are now going to be given the spirit of God? These are the people who in Egypt were the taskmasters. And there was a layer, there was a layer of Jews over the Jewish servants, over the Jewish slaves. And when, it, and when the Egyptian, the Egyptians would come to these taskmasters and say, why aren't they doing their thing? And the taskmaster, task. Masters, say that five times quickly. The task masters were beaten because they refused to beat their brothers. And because they took a blow for their brothers, therefore, when Hashem needs somebody to, who, who's going to be the leaders and who's going to speak the word of God, he's like, those are my people. The people who were, they could have they could have passed it on. They could have passed the pain on, but they didn't. They absorbed it for themselves. And they said, we're going to protect the people under us as much as we can. When it comes time to do something amazing and special and have, have Ruach HaKodesh, have the spirit of Hashem on you, Hashem's like, those are the people. Because first of all, the people know them. They recognize them from Egypt and they recognize them as being in a bad place, but being but trying to protect them as best as they could. And, and as a reward for their behavior. Now, Hashem says, take 70. We have 12 tribes. How do you divide 70 by 12? Some of our math people. How do you divide 70 by 12? Huh? 
We have 12 tribes. Each tribe needs to send representatives. We're gonna, we need a total of 70. No, not 10 over. If you melt, if you melt, if, if each 12 sends six, then you have 72, correct? So then you have two extra, right? So you don't have, you can't get, 70 is not divisible by 12. You have a remainder of two. So what basically happened was that each tribe sent six, they picked lots. There's different discussions how it happened. They picked lots, 70 stayed with Moshe and were given uh, the spirit of Hashem and two were sent back. And what happens is, is that the two that were sent back, uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna hear from them in a second. I'm just trying to see if they're, if that's the next thing that happens here. No, so first Hashem says, we're gonna get the thing. We're gonna get to the two people in a second. The next thing Hashem says, I'm gonna give them meat till it is coming out of every single orifice. They're not gonna be able to say that I didn't give them to them because I couldn't, which is such an interesting thing. You know, like we talk about the Jews in the desert and that place of, they lived, yes, they lived through hell, but they also lived through the most incredible, incredible revelations of Hashem. They lived through the plagues and the splitting of the sea and revelation. And there's still that place where like, it's so hard to be in the daily, the daily, you know, we, now what, now what, now what? And one of the things Hasidus talks about is like, the beginning of their relationship with Hashem is so overwhelming. It's like they're bombarded with miracles that they can't, they can't hold on to. It's not, it's not, it's just so much. As soon as they're asked to do anything normal, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to like just be. They can only be super miraculous. They can only live in that plane because the, they don't have any experience really with, with, uh, with how do you live life and do your do your whole situation they only know how to like be overwhelmed with incredible miracles and incredible revelation and they don't know how to really do this this day-to-day -day thing anyway so they're gonna have the meat so Hashem's like so like the complaining is coming from a place like a place of immaturity of spiritual immaturity of of you know of, of needing uh you know and, and this is what's happening so this is what happens Moshe, Moshe says you can't possibly give them enough because they're just complaining Hashem's like we're going to give it to them and we're going to see what's going to happen. They have this. So then, so that's, we have like those two introductions. Then we have the 70 people come. Hashem gives them their, their they get some of the Ruach HaKadosh and we don't hear. And then all of a sudden in chapter 11, verse 26, we hear the two people stayed in the camp. And one of the people's name is Eldad and the other person is Medad. And they also got the spirit of Hashem, but they were not with Moshe in the Olamoid. They were in the middle of the camp, wherever the middle of the camp is, and they start giving prophecy. And one of the, and, and by Yorat Hanar, and he comes to Moshe, and the question is, who is this? There's, there's, who is this? So Rashi says that it was Gershom, it was Moshe's son who comes. Um, and he says, and, and Moshe and he says, they're, gi they're giving prophecy in the middle of the camp, and you should, Yoshua says, you should kill them, you should wipe them out, this shouldn't happen. And what's Moshe's response? I wish everybody was a prophet. I wish everybody could have the spirit of God rest on them. I wish, like, I don't be jealous. Don't be jealous that, that that's what's happening. I wish everybody could, uh, could, could, could have the Hashem spirit rest on them. The Medrash actually tells us what Eldad and Medad's prophecy was. Their prophecy was, and remember where we are, we're year two after leaving Egypt. They left Egypt. It was the second year after they left Egypt. So they left Egypt like a year ago, whatever. The prophecy that they give is that Moshe is going to die and Joshua is going to take them into the land of Israel. Um, and, and Joshua's like, no, 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 no. Kill him, kill him. No, no, no. And Moshe's like, say that, but everybody had prophecy. Now I want to point out that by hearing this prophecy now, Yoshua, Joshua was put in a very uncomfortable position because in two par uh, next week's Parsha and Parsha Shlach, when he's part of the group that got sent to spy out the land of Israel, how can he come back and say that the land is beautiful and we should go into the land? Because everybody's going to say, oh, we know, we, he just wants to be a leader. He wants Moshe to die. He wants to be a leader. Of course, that's why he's saying it. 
right? So it, th- there's many layers to this. Now, the other part of this conversation of them, uh, of them, of them, of this prophecy that Moshe is going to die is that, g- that it's going to foreshadow the fact that at the end of Moshe's life, when he hits the rock and God's like, okay, you're not going to the land of Israel. We know that that was a setup. Moshe was never going into the land of Israel. We know it here. Kate, we got the prophecy here already that he was not going to the land of Israel. And the third thing that's going to happen because of this is, uh, first of all, we're going, to have, we're going to have a break in their thing. Oh, no, it's right here. Uh, they, uh, we have over here, we're going to have a couple of verses that they got all meat. And people collected it and they ate it and they died. And I have to say, like as a, as a side person a little bit, um, if I knew that Hashem was giving me something that he thought I had asked for improperly, would I actually have eaten the meat? I, I would like to think I would not have. I would like to think that I would, you know, I don't know what I actually would have done. Like barbecue, like, I don't know, kind of have the barbecue with us. But like, I would like to think that that I wouldn't have. I, I don't. I don't actually believe like I was. I'm better than they were. But you got to think like they tested God in a massive way, and God's like, "I'm going to give it to you. You'll see. I'm going to give it to you." So you can't say that I don't have enough. He probably didn't say it's open to, like in, so with such attitude. But then would you actually eat it? Would you? And they actually ate it and they died. I'm like, yeah, they did it. And so like, I, I probably would also have eaten it along with the rest of them. But I just would. I, this part of me is like, don't eat it. Don't eat it. You know what's going to happen over here. Anyway. So that's, we have, we have like all our, our pieces are coming to the end. And then the last thing we have over here is that Miriam and Aaron talk about Moshe. And uh, they're talking about the, the Isha Hakushit Asher Lakach. Got this Ethiopian black woman that he, that he, that he married. And they say, did he only, did Hashem only speak to Moshe? We are also, we're also prophets and Hashem hears this. And now the Torah gives us the most powerful statement that Hashem has ever said about anybody in Pasuk Gimel, verse 3, Moshe anav ma'od kol ha'adam adama. that Moshe is the most humble person that ever walked on the face of the earth. And that's clearly not Moshe's like, this is God's putting in here. You want to know who you're talking about? You're talking about the person who is so trustworthy in other places it talks about that, and the other in other places it talks about that the Hashem describes Moshe as he's trustworthy in all my house, that he could come into this, to the celestial spheres, see what's happening. And if he's not supposed to say something, he's not going to say anything about it. Moshe was like, Hashem's like, don't mess with Moshe. Don't mess with Moshe. Right. And, and so what happens is that all of a sudden Hashem suddenly comes to speak to Moshe and Aaron and Miriam and, and, and Moshe and, and all of a sudden they see that Miriam has, Miriam has saras. Miriam has leprosy because she spoke about her brother. About her brother, she spoke Hashem Hara, um, and and Hashem basically tells him, "How dare you speak about Moshe like this? I speak face to face with him. He's not. He oh here it says right here. He bol- called Basi Neman, who he's totally trustworthy in my house. I speak to him. He's his 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 prophecy is not like any other prophet. He's Rambam actually says that Moshe is the source of all prophecy." that mo- we believe in any prophet because we believe in Moshe as a prophet and every single prophet's prophecy according to the Rambam, according to Maimonides, comes somehow through Moshe. And Hashem's like, how dare you speak about Moshe like this? And then he leaves. And when he leaves, we find, boom, Miriam has Saras. And Aaron says to Moshe, you, you, need to he- you need to heal her. You need to cure her somehow miraculously. The only Kohanim who are alive right now are her relatives. A relative is not allowed to do the purification process for a relative. If you don't help her somehow, then she we can't un, we can't unleprosy her because because we can't do it. It has to come from a miracle. And Moshe gives the all, world's all time uh, you know shortest prayer on behalf of his sister, and he says, "Kel na rafan Allah, God, please heal her." And Rashi says. <laughs> love the Jews. Rashi says, why does he give such a short prayer? Because the Jews are either going to say his sister is suffering and he's like, you know, spending all this time in prayer or they're going to say, oh, for his sister, he spends all this time in prayer, but for us, he doesn't. No winning with the Jews is not a new situation. Um, and, um, and so, and so she, 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 in fact, gets 
cured and the Jewish people wait until she is fully cured before they start to travel. I mean, we know the cloud lifted up. We had that conversation. The cloud lifted up, they're supposed to go, but this whole thing happened in the interim. They don't move until Miriam is brought back into the camp. And Rashi says, why? Why is that done? Because, first of all, it's very painful for somebody who has Saras to actually travel. And because Miriam, as a five-year-old, stood by the Nile and watched her brother, her brother, to see what was going to happen with him, um, right now, the entire Jewish people wait for Miriam as a, a payback, you know, kindness for kindness. They're going to pay back Miriam with kindness because of the, the time that she waited for her brother. They're going to wait for her and they're going to bring her back in. We have two minutes. I'm going to take two minutes. Why are you speaking about Moshe? What, what, what's the conversation that's going on now? And, and, and Rashi brings from, from different sources that it's connected to this incident with Eldad and Medad. Because when somebody came up and told them that there are two people giving prophecy in the camp, so Tsipora, Moshe's wife, according to Rashi, says, oh, I feel bad for their wives because their husbands are going to... They, I feel bad for their wives because they're going to separate from their wives. And Miriam's like, what? What? We're, we're, we're prophets. We're not celibate. That's not a Jewish thing. Um, and she didn't, and she, and so she and Aaron start discussing the situation, right? Now, first of all, the, the, the Talmud tells us, you have a problem with somebody, go speak to them. Don't talk to other people about them, right? But the other thing is, and, you know, <clears throat> that was part A and part B is emotion not going into the Holy Land. Miriam and Aaron look at each other and say, why is Moshe going to the Holy Land? Why is he going to the Holy Land? What's wrong? What did he do wrong that he's not going to the Holy Land? We're going to the Holy Land now. P.S. Parentheses. They don't know yet that they're not either going to the Holy Land. But they're like, if he's not going to the Holy Land, like... <clears throat> What's going on? And then Sephora says, so like, wait a second, he's kind of making himself into like a bigger deal than he is. We're prophets. We all have the same thing. And essentially what Hashem is going to come down and tell them, there is only one Moshe ever. He is the source of all prophecy for everybody. And just like we said in the beginning, when the people had a problem and about, about Pesach Shani and Moshe says to them, wait here and I'll get an answer for you. Moshe is the only prophet that can do that he's a prophet on a totally 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 different level and and the fact that they were speaking about him meant that they did not understand what his what his level was and what his stature was and in fact the, the very short because we're we're going to talk about it a little bit more next week but in the conversation of Moshe not going to the holy land he's he is the quintessential leader and when his people don't go into the Holy Land, neither does he, because somebody needs to take care of those, those people who don't make it into the Holy Land, and that's Moshe's job. Moshe's job is to stay with the people who are, in fact, not going to make it into the Holy Land. We did a lot, a lot of things. We touched on a lot of things. I want to give us all a bracha. In, in, uh, in, in Kabbalah and Hasidus, it talks a little bit about the idea that everybody has, has like a, a touch of Moshe in them. We all have the ability to to be connected and to do the right thing and to do to stand up and to to do more than we think we can do. So I want to give us a bracha that we realize that we have incredible, incredible capabilities. We should be able to tap into the ability that we have to to spring higher and to do more and to and to stretch ourselves and to not say oh, but I can't and to really ask ourselves what does Hashem want of me here in this situation because there's always something there. Have an awesome rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.